A man, the who, made a film about. A man who needs no introduction is Irish Jack. straight away because this has been filmed so there's only a minimum of time but I will speak after I do this piece. I'm Irish Jack, grew up in London, met the Who when I was 19, they were 17. We'd all just started in our first jobs. When the band became successful they wrote songs about me. All of which beggars the question who do I think I am? <laughs> or who do you think I am? <laughs> I was born on Sunday, the 7th of November, 1943, at 7pm in the front room of 60 Galabi Street, which lies beneath the shadow of St. Finbar's Cathedral and a stone throw from University College Cork. Before marriage, my father, Sean Lyons, lived in a large country residence called Mill House in Kilcully. The house is situated on the road leading to St. Catherine Cemetery, if you're coming from the Black Man Pub. Its gated entrance sits at the double bend on the road on the left. Mill House still stands to this day and is presently occupied by a professor of Irish medieval studies and it was once the residence of Cork's first ever Lady Lord Mayor, Janie Dowdall. My father, Sean, studied classical violin under Alois Fleischmann, senior. He also excelled at saxophone, so I grew up listening to meditation on his violin and melody in blue on sax. My father met my mother, Anna Wagner, at the Cayley dances which my paternal grandmother ran every Sunday at Mill House. Each one of my father's five brothers played a musical instrument, some dubbing on violin and piano, and they provided the music from my grandmother's dances. Before I emigrated to London to live with my aunt and uncle, I remember freezing front rooms in Ballyfee Han, my father rubbing raw into his hands to give his fingers life, and me, like some kind of future song engineer, standing next to the old bush tape recorder, its wide spool buttons the size of piano keys, the microphone delicately placed across the top of an empty pint glass, and its long extension lead spilling into the sugar bowl on the dining table. My father would almost crush the bones in his hands, heating up the blood in his fingers for the concerto in E minor. At 16 and a half, in August 1960, I left the Cox School of Commerce in Morrison's Island. This was the first institution where I mixed with girls. <laughs> I quickly discovered that I was quite useless with these things called girls and woodwork. <laughs> like my father, I was a man of the nib. Later that month, on Monday the 29th of August, I began my working life in the post room of the London Electricity Board in Shepherd's Bush, West London. By June 1962, I am 19, and due to my age, I am attending Hammersmith Day College while still working at the London Electricity Board. Having watched Sunday night at the London Palladium on the television, I have heard the earth-shattering Apache by the shadows. I've spent hours listening to soapbox auditors at Hyde Park telling people that the end of the world is nigh and to prepare to meet thy doom. I have stood 12 feet from Yuri Gagarin, the first man to orbit the earth at the Olympia in Kensington on a college trip. I have survived the Cuban arms crisis in living dread 
that Nikita Khrushchev would press the magic button and I have fallen head over heels in love with a Jamaican clippy on a 267 bus <laughs> who used to call me her little Irish friend. Never charged me and had a backside the size of Canada. <laughs> Sometime in June, I nervously mounted three steps of Bosley's dance hall in Faroe Road in Shepherd's Bush. From outside, I can hear the strains of chubby checkers, let's twist again. My dress is typical of the times, starting from the ground up. A pair of size 7 Cuban heeled winkle picker boots to enhance my height with striped socks. A pair of skin tight Prince of Wales check trousers. A colourless Pierre Cardin cardigan with enamel buttons. Over that, a white shorty Mac. And on my head, a green Robin Hood hat with mandatory feather. <laughs> as cool as I obviously thought I was, all I was short to complete the wardrobe was a pair of black framed spectacles, thus enabling me to resemble Hank B. Marvin of the Shadows. <laughs> because... In all honesty, Hank B. Marvin was God. Long before someone would take it upon themselves to dog Clapton as God on a public wall. Having paid my three shillings and sixpence admission, I handed my Mac and hat into the cloakroom. I stood at one side of the dance floor while every one of the 32 souls present stood at the other, looking over at me. <laughs> it occurred to me that Bosley's Saturday night dance was more of a club atmosphere, where everybody obviously knew each other, me being the exception. The band had elected to play on the floor because the stage was so big. There was five in the band, or as my classically trained father would have said, there was a quintet. <laughs> the first thing that struck me was their funeral suits. White shirts and ties with three-pointed cardboard handkerchiefs in the top pocket. They all looked my age except the drummer, who had the letters DS emblazoned on his single bass drum. He looked ten years older. The singer, Colin Dawson, seemed lobotomized upon the personae of one Cliff Richard. He even looked like him and sang several Cliff hits like Move It and The Young Ones. I found out these names later. The lead guitarist, Roger Daughtry, doubled on trombone. The bass player, John Entwistle, also played trumpet. The drummer, Doug Sandham, with the big DS on his bass drum, looked the most confident in the band. This was, of course, long before Keith Moon came to join the band. The rhythm guitarist stood to the side and played a large jumbo guitar. As I stood at the side of the dance floor, feeling petrified and finding that it now took as much courage to leave as I had taken to come in, I listened to the band. They did some trans tra jazz numbers by Akabilk and a lot of Shadows material. They even did the dance steps while playing. The sweat gathered under my arms some nerves, and I knew that nobody was ever going to talk to me. If they had done, they would have discovered a man suffering from an almighty case of self-doubt because everything about me seemed wrong. For one, I was a disappointing five foot seven, enhanced to five nine by my Cuban heel boots. <laughs> Two, my real accent was Cork and definitely not Shepherd's Bush. The trouble was, the Cork accent sang with a lilt and sounded Welsh. And when I told people I wasn't Welsh, I was from Cork, they just looked at me like I was a liar from the Vanities. <laughs> Next, my name. I've been christened John after my father, Sean. But at some stage, my maternal grandmother endeared me with Jackie. And i have been Jackie since I was a toddler. However, once I started work in the offices of the London Electricity Board, every time I told someone my name, they just looked at me and laughed, saying, you're not Jackie, you're Jack. Jackie's a girl's name, mate. So I'd be Jack all day at work and out with my friends. Then I'd get back to 22 Kellen Scott Gardens, and the first thing my aunt would ask when I get in the door was, 
How did you get out of work today, Jackie? <laughs> Schizophrenia. <laughs> How did this? My last big complex was my hair. It was a mass of coiled springs, and it drove me to despair. Before going out, I would dip my head in a basin of cold water, then dry it off to attain the straight hair effect. The hair would lank across my forehead, and I'd be on top of the world. Then two hours later, it would be back to coil springs. <laughs> my hair was the biggest thing in my life. <laughs> so my complexes were quite full. Four sweating sticks of dynamite strapped to a loner wearing a white shorty mat and a pair of height-enhancing Cuban heel boots. I just stood there, too scared to dance and too scared to even talk to anyone. While I looked around me, trying to stoke up the courage to leave, I found myself zeroing in on one of the band. He was tall, something I would never be. He had straight hair like it meant nothing to him. He had a guitar strapped on, and it stood to reason he probably even had a girlfriend. He had a nose like a troll. Really, it was classic, like Rembrandt's barrette. <laughs> Some people might have viewed it as an unfortunate disposition of the face, which only the owner knew the secret of. But I was mesmerized and told myself he had everything I wanted. I thought if I had a nose like that, it would be a weapon, because nobody would be bothered with my height, my accent, my name, my hair. They'd all be too busy looking at my nose. <laughs> We exaggerate as we get older, we all do, but to me this guy appeared like a piece of mystical light. When the dance was over and the miserable 32 had drifted off into the night, the band were taking 20 watt amps off steel tubular chairs. I crossed the well-polished dance floor like an idiot, not sure if he can walk on water. I approached the lanky guy with the longest nose I'd ever seen, put my hand out and said, hello. I'm Jack from Shepherd's Bush, and in that funny way that Londoners have of repeating what you just said, he said, hello Jack from Shepherd's Bush, I'm Pete from Ealing. And he was, he was Pete Townsend from Ealing Common. I looked around and nodded to the rest of the band who eyed me with curiosity. Within a few weeks, I was calling out to his house with acoustic strings when they should have been electric. <laughs> <laughs> the band were called Detours. And we were all so young, we weren't even the who. Mm. And then, that was the start of me. So, that's who I think I am. Uh. <laughs> okay, this, this, uh, this is called the, the um, <clears throat> Roots of Quadrophenia. Um, in 1972, I was working as a bus conductor in Cork, married with our first child. I returned to Ireland from London in 1968 met the girl of my wallet and settled down into family life and moderate social behaviour. Although now back in Cork I had never lost touch with my old friend Pete Townsend. We walked regularly to each other, swapping respective baby weights and telling each other what better men we had become because of our beautiful wives. Pete was amused to discover that I had become a bus conductor, a bit of a change from my job with the non-electricity board filing documents, having LSD for breakfast and LSD for lunch. <laughs> In one particular letter of mine, where I think I used up 14 or 15 pages of handwriting, I informed Pete that I had recently become the first bus conductor in Cork to wear Dr. Martin boots. <laughs> I had bought them, size 7, 8 hole, in a shoe shop in Cork called Drummies on Levitt's Quay. Pete's response to this news was to tell me he was elated in the knowledge that one of his oldest friends had embraced 70s youth culture, even if I was 29 at the time, and he only two years behind. The next letter from him was full of social comment about youth culture. I sent him my old Gold Talk Social Club membership card and uh, requesting to return it to me by registered post. When it came back, to me, through the GDL auspices of my local post office, there was a letter from him saying how great it was to hold on to something like that for so long. And that now he was thinking of writing a follow-up to Tommy. God forbid, but I think he referred to it as a mod opera. <laughs> 
In the next spasm of letters between us, I started reminding him of some of the things we did when we were mods down at the old Goldhawk Club in Shepherd's Bush. And some of these letters formulated a background to what has become quadrophenia. But it wasn't as simple as that. Pete just didn't sit down and write quadrophenia in a mad muse. He had already written a song called Long Live Rock, which later appeared on the Odds and Sods album. And it is this song that was to provide the germ for quadrophenia. Six lines which appear in the second verse typify the Who's boisterous performing history and that of a certain individual of cock origin. People walking sideways pretending that they're leaving. We put on our makeup and work out all the lead-ins. Jack is in the alley selling tickets made in Hong Kong. Promoters in the pay box wondering where the band's gone. <laughs> Back in the pub, the governor stops the clock. Rock is dead, they say. Long live rock. Not long after, in July 1973, I went to London for a holiday with my wife, who by now was heavily pregnant with our second child. Although we were staying at my old West London home, my wife wanted to visit her auntie Emily in Dagenham overnight. Being a shepherd's bush boy, this was the other side of the world for me. As soon as we arrived, we discovered that there was to be an immediate and unscheduled gap in the evening's conversation, whereby Auntie Emily, sorry, whereby nobody could speak for half an hour, as dear old Auntie Emily was a Coronation Street fanatic. <laughs> At some point during this enforced television vigil, I phoned my old friend Pete Townsend and was pleasantly surprised to discover that he, like me, wasn't too bothered about Coronation Street. <laughs> we agreed to meet later that evening in the ship bar in Water Street, just a few doors down from the old marquee. We lofted a few beers and passed comment on the fashion sense of our respective bell bottoms and our Edwardian locks. Then he took me down to a tiny little studio somewhere in Soho and to my great surprise played me the entire Quadrophenia tapes. We went back to the ship after which suitably inebriated Townsend pushed me into a cab and stuck a 50 pound note into my pocket, a fortune in those days for the taxi ride back to Dagenham. The lights were out at Auntie Emily's and it was pitch black inside. I crept around trying to remember the lie of the place. Very gently, not wanting to disturb Auntie Emily from one of her wet dreams about the rose of turn. <laughs> I opened the door and walked straight into a closet. The bump of my head wasn't too sore, too sore, and soon I found the right bedroom. I switched on the bedside lamp to find my wife fast asleep. I smiled to myself as I studied the face of the sleeping angel. As men do. <laughs> I tucked in warm to her back and thought back on the evening. It occurred to me that while I had spent the last few hours with my idol, talking about the old days, about mods, pedals, scooters, clothes and the fantastic music we used to listen to. He had taken me to a studio to listen to his not quite yet finished album. He had once referred to in a letter to me as a mod opera and I had heard this months before anyone would hear it. And the strange thing was that he had written this brilliant piece of music at the height of the progressive rock period. Progressive rock as the music papers called it. Led Zeppelin, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Deep Purple the very music that would give rise to heavy metal. And it hit me with the force of a hammer that in the four hours we'd been talking, there hadn't been a single mod in sight all evening. Not one. They just didn't exist in 1973. Rock was populated by denim and long hair. Later in October, when the album was released, and Pete Townsend would do interviews telling the press that Quadrophenia was based on me, Irish Jack, I never made a penny out of it. Was I ever supposed to make some money out of it? I never took out a copyright on my name, and I never expected to tell me I should be living in a house with 14 bedrooms and driving around in a Saab. <laughs> I worked as a postman. I didn't drive the post office van that killed Jimmy Scooter. Those old Dr. Martins are long gone. I ride a Peugeot Vespa 
and I live in a council house in Guanabrahar. What a f***ing life. <laughs>